We got uh, Oasis 2 up there on the, in the spot, streaming you live. I'm going to go ahead and mute the audience, and um, we will unmute when we get to questions. Send myself an SMS. Okay, yeah, I, I think I can just control it. Yeah, okay, cool. Okay, I got it connected to my phone. When should I start? Do we have a, a MC? What's up, guys? Everybody, show some support. Give some some know, sweet it's so, emojis. It's so, it's so different in that uh, you, I can't hear anyone talking, so I, you know, we rely on the emojis. Um, so the, the talk's going to be a little bit, you know, close to home in the fact that you know we're all kind of dealing with this virus, and this is something that I, I spend a lot of time in thinking of ways to tie the real world into the cyber world. And I, I do a lot of that, uh, you know, explaining to people like what I do or how something that would occur in the real world and how it relates into the cyber world. So um, the idea behind this is the to compare and contrast our current situation and how it relates to security. And um, I just finished these these slides like a couple hours ago just because I was going to get a totally different talk about a tool that I had had written but then I'd realized in this new realm that uh, thank you for everyone who's worked so hard to put this on uh, you know I don't think I could have shared my computer screen and showed you all the cool things so I decided I was just going to come up with a, a new talk and I you know started last night and here are the slides so we'll see how it goes but um, a little bit about myself. Uh, so, in in this talk, uh, you know, I've always been a red, a red and a blue type person. I'm a you know a defender, offender, the nicest evil uh, bad guy that you'll probably ever meet. Uh, very involved with uh, Set KC. I'm a dad. Uh, we'll get going here. So congratulations, all of you are now doctors. You know, that was very easy for us to all become doctors. All you had to do is just show up to this, uh, this room and uh, you're now a doctor. So as a, as a doctor, um, you're going to have to have terrible handwriting, which I think that I've, I've got that down. It was my friends and you know, my wife, she's like, what did you write here? And, I have no idea what I have written there. You know, even when looking at my notes when I was uh, coming up with these slides, you know, sometimes like I'm like, what is that? Like, but uh, you're going to be also as a doctor, you're going to have to be um, very opinionated. You know, you're you have to have strong inputs and give give advice. So um, when when looking at this pandemic, and you know, did people forget? about washing their hands is that what happened you, you go to the the grocery store and you know like all the soap is gone was this like a reminder that you know as you know the news and doctors and specialists came out they were getting on the news saying like hey um you should wash your hands for 20 minutes so i, I assume everyone had forgotten how to do that and that's why you know uh the toilet paper is gone people didn't know how to wipe their ass and, that's what my assumption is, you know, as a doctor, yeah. Uh, so going along this, so if we kind of, you know, transfer that advice into the security world, um, maybe this is a good time, you, you know, to use something like MFA. You know, your, your users are probably, you know, distraught that they're, you know, working from home, but this might not be the best time to turn on MFA, but... 
a lot of times I always hear that companies don't turn on two-factor because it has to do with um, them not providing the company w with a phone or, you know, s something of that nature that you need to give the individual uh, a way of using a cell phone. Otherwise, I'm not going to participate. Like, well, that's fine. Well, we'll give you a laptop and we'll also make you carry, you know, a, a two-factor device instead. And, you know, a lot of times people are like, well, I'd rather use my phone. You know, and then I've had discussions with, you know, HR where they're saying, um, well, we, we can't do that. We can't force them to use their personal phone because of X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, well, we'll give them the option because most people will want to you know, use their cell phone. They'll just figure that out. And, you know, the other argument that I always have with this is, um, well, you require me to drive to work, so I'm gonna ac actually going to need you to buy me a car so I can get to work. You know, that's my, my counteract to them saying that they need to have a phone for the two-factor. But these are the good advice that, you know, we've always been saying, but now it kind of translates to what, in, you know, the industry of, you know, the doctors and what we're dealing with is, you know, let's have strong uh, passwords. Uh, you know, we should disable macros, um, you know, remove admin rights, zero trust on, on the network. So um, the, these are, are definitely good security hygiene practices that, you know, we should be using. But as you all know, we do all this and we still somehow get sick. Uh, it just happens, you know. Viruses are always looking for new hosts, and you know, they will, you know, they'll lie in dormant and wait for you to do something like stay up till four in the morning working on your slides or something weird like that, and you eventually get, uh, you know, sick. Uh, and attackers are the same way, you know. They just wait and they'll try and. You know, they'll try different things, and it's a matter of time before your system actually gets sick. So, you know, this is just some of the things that, you know, occur, you know, sometimes you don't even know what happens, but, you know, these are the more prevalent ones that happen to your machine or to your users' computers that they'll see. Um, but you need to layer in the security and, and figure out from the logs, uh, you know, taking all that, figuring out what's, what's normal. But, um, you know, as you you're you know, moving around, having to get food and that sort of thing, there are times where you'll have an exposure. And, um, you know, they give advice, you know, you should, you know, distance yourself, social distancing, self-quarantine, that sort of thing, if, if you might have been expo exposed. And, like, that, this is the current guidance. And we... We have the same um, guidance as well, you know, as from security professionals, you know, things that you should do if uh, an exposure happens. Maybe you should do a memory dump, a uh, snapshot, you know. These are just, um, I'm kind of just giving you a, a rough bit here just because, you know, there's thousands of things you should do here. But, um, you know, doing a memory dump, you know, resetting the, the password, actually asking the user, do you re you use your passwords. If you're reusing your passwords, there's a chance that the bad guys might have grabbed some of your your cookies or you know stole a password off the your desktop. And teaching them about um, you know talking about 2FA, they should lock down their you know devices. Yes, you know if you were earlier talking, uh, if you're at Dave's talk, um, if you stay a little bit later, you would have seen that uh, you know he was talking about how you he was able to bypass 2FA, but, you know, these are layered securities. They're just small little things that help, you know, protect the company. Look for, uh, like, lateral movement, um, you know, un understanding that did you really need to format the computer? Was there a real infection, you know, going through the logs? You know, the typical who, when, where, what, why, and how sort of thing. Uh, so let, let's look about look at the immune system. So the body has an immune system to kind of protect itself and defend, and that translates really well um, into you know our layered defense and the fact that your company ha has an immune system, and that's made up of you know, typically you guys and you know the network 
you know, all the tools that you buy and all the teams that you work with. So as we all work together to defend the company, that is your immune system, you know. Um, and when we um, dive a little bit deep, deeper in, into here, so it's kind of broken up in as that your innate uh, immunity is your AV. You know, that's your default thing. You know, they, you know, they always talk about AV and, you know, later on I'll kind of, I'll jump back to AV, but um, you've got adaptive and active and that would be like your own intel. You know, the stuff that you've broken apart or you've been attacked with before, something that you've seen that you've taken the time to say, hey, we need to block this uh, domain, uh, you know, pull this, all this, you uh, emails out of everyone's inbox, that, that sort of thing. Then you have your passive immunity, and maybe you belong to some sort of sharing group. Um, and I'll, I'll get into that a little bit later, but uh, from a, a sharing perspective, you know, the, this is stuff that other groups give your c company, or maybe it just sits in your inbox and, you know, you don't take a look at it until it's too late, you know, you've already been hit with it. But um, the passive immunity is, it's only used for a short time. It would be like the, the bad guys have a C2 stood up and after a while, you know, they'll change to a different um, C2 and, you know, do something different. So then that block is essentially useless. But your adaptive immunity is more like your memory. This is something that you'll remember how this works. That might be some long-term thing that you've learned from a, a previous attack that you're going to continue to do so this doesn't happen again. You know, comes to mind is maybe you allowed HTA files to come in through your email system or you allowed executables into your um, exchange environment. Those are things that you're like, you know, we should probably not um, do that again. But uh, there's also a immune deficiency problem where you know your number one job is not to block google uh, definitely you will instantly cause the whole company to freak out if you block google um, also what happens is like you know those government agencies they'll be willing to share their indicators but the thing when they get the information they're not allowed to redact a lot of the information that's given to them. So they have to present it as is. So if I do a PCAP of my machine getting compromised, it has two bad URLs, and at the time I was streaming YouTube, by their laws of whatnot, they have to give you all that intelligence as is. So there is probably going to be false positives. So that would be your deficiency that you're shooting yourself in the foot and causing you know grief or pain to your um, company by um, blocking something that you shouldn't. Uh, let's see. So when we talk about samples, as a doctor, you really can't go to people's house and get samples. You know, you came like, hey, are you sick? I want to borrow some tissues or whatever. You know go through their trash, that, that sort of thing. Um, I think you would lose your uh, license if you were just say, rummaging through and you know, they figured out that you were a doctor and you're like, oh, I was just looking for samples. As a hacker, that might be a good cover story. You're like, oh, I, was, you know, I heard someone was sick over here you know, as a social engineering tactic. But um, as security professionals, we're allowed to have those samples. And you know, these are just some sites that you can go and get these samples to see what the you know, virus is doing or what type of attacks that are out there, or things that you should be looking for in your own environment. And breaking them down into not just, let's just block the URL, but understanding how to take apart the, the underlining data and you know a good example would be is, are the bad guys always using the same um, image file or the image hash of this you know whatever the compromise kit that they're using so whenever it's displaying on your computer they always use the same hash of this one JPEG and you use that to pivot laterally I'll kind of I'll, I'll show you you know something that here shortly 
but uh, there's there's lots of places that you can get threat intelligence. Um, if you think about you know how the flu shot is created, you know it's it's a dead virus, so to speak, and it would be not anything different than your AV building a signature to help your you know defend against your your company. Um, it it wouldn't be something like they would take a weaponized zero day and store that into the AV and then match that real live you know piece of malware on your di on your disk and say like hey does this look like um, a rat or not does this look like the same rat you know as they you know the AV is like checking that they they break it down into to signatures and you know that's kind of where the AV falls down that if it doesn't always look exactly how they wrote the signature it's going to get past your capabilities so uh, building your own threat intelligence it, it's it's a key thing that you should do and understand um, and I'll kind of relate to that a little bit more when we talk about red team um, and blue team but uh, if you like want to terrorize your incident response team, it's always fun to, you know, uh, label your SSID as Mimi Cats and then go back to your network at work and let that signature trigger off some EDR system and you know have them freak out that you know your machine had uh, Mimi Cats. But uh, yeah, yeah, like it's just some laughter's over there. But uh, we'll keep going here. Uh, so as I was talking about pivots, so this was you know a snapshot I grabbed. I think it was last night or this morning. I don't know when, but um, this is like a Netflix fish. And um, what I'm showing here is that there's a hash image that the the kit that they're using to fish people, it's related to 79 other uh, sources. So that would be different uh, websites that are also hosting this. So. As a, we'll just say a normal person, they would just block this one domain and that would be it. So I got your company sees a fish, I see that this weird domain, and all I do is I go and block that. that that's it. Where if we were a little bit more advanced, what we'd want to do is we want to share that threat intelligence. If it's not extremely targeted to your corporation, like we're not talking about, you know, this is, you know, some zero day or you know you're a you're a main target and this affects your corporation and it can be tied back to your corporation because of the URL you want to publicly share this and you know URL scan and virus total those are great places to share it so other uh, intelligence agents or even other companies maybe even your AV is out there they're consuming all this to build signatures to you know help you in that path so as you put this in here you're like hey there's other 79 domains also like this, why don't we block these two? Or maybe of the 79, we realize it's only five IP addresses and they're all sitting in you know, China or Russia or whatever. That might be you know, something else that you'd want to block. Um, but in the real world, we also ha have to deal, you, know, you, you, you see all of the, I don't know if you, People were texting me and you know, telling me, like, oh, you better go to the store because the National Guard's going to show up and you won't be able to leave your house. And, you know, disinformation happens all the time. So, uh, you know, there's all these various things that, you know, only, this virus only affects um, old people. So young people can go do whatever they, they, they want. They're, you know, they're not affected, so to speak. But, um, you know, Lots of disinformation, and and that also occurs with our user base as well. So, um, you have nothing to steal. That's never the case, and it's always something that you should not um, take with, like very lightly. Uh, you are you have your personality or the person who you are is something that they would like to steal. If I can become you, I can earn the trust of somebody else and pivot down. So, you know, I'm just going to make up a scenario here. It would be if I was able to fish you, compromise you, and then, you know, get your grandma who's, you know, her grandson actually works for DARPA or whatever, you know, do some t lateral pivot. That's what the bad guys are after. You know, um, look at all the small mom and pop shops that are making like screws and widgets for, 
you know, government contracts. That they're going down the supply chain because that's the easy um, way into the bigger corporations. So corporate, like bigger corporations, are looking down at the supply chain and say, "Hey, you guys need to step up. We, you guys need to start doing this stuff too. We need to make sure that you're secure. We want to start sharing with you." Um, other things like, you know, I use a Mac, I can't get viruses, or, you know, I have my password's 23 characters long, it's okay to reuse it because it's got a really long key, you know, it's very strong. Um, and, you know, one, I would say, disinformation would be, um, I figured I should just mess with all the Oculus people real quick, or, you know, but this is my disinformation you know it's not real so this is like those people that have the headsets on they're like like uh oh what what just happened here you know, uh you know, there there was an error but uh you no know, a lot of more of the the disinformation you know um looking getting people to realize that the controls that we have come along with the disinformation they kind of need to mesh together we need to figure out What's what's the right a little what's the right way to share enough information that's you know we don't sound like we all have tinfoil hats on because you know I think a lot of people think that they're like well I'm not going to use the internet anymore because I talked to Trent and he says the internet's scary and you know I can get hacked instantly that sort of thing but um, practice makes perfect uh, if we look at you know what uh, the various you know, governments were doing as, you know, simulations. Yeah, they did something at least. At least they tried. It might have not been, you know, the the right path that they were hoping for. And they might not have realized that, you know, this was going to be a lot bigger than what they were planning for. You know, no matter um, how small it is, I'm very big on just do something. doesn't matter how small it is. At least you've tried and you've gone down that. you've And you learned something from it. Um, if you're a small company, there's no way that you can plan for a nation state. You know, if a nation state wants to hack you, they will. And that's just how it's going to be. You're, as a small company, you can't compete against that. Same thing kind of happens here. You know, like they weren't prepared for this, you know, virus that was just going to spread all over the world. And, you know, unfortunately, people have, you know, died and, and, and whatnot. And, very terrible, but those are the things that you just have practice makes perfect. And that kind of translates to, you know, the stuff that, that you guys are already doing. Um, tabletop exercise, pen tests, red teaming, purple teaming, and, you know, fishing your users. Um, you know, I know that users get angry when you fish them or you trick them, it, but if they, if they pass, so what? You I mean, they're going to get real fishes anyway, you know, um, they might as well understand what they should do with it. And, you know, I always try to share stories with them, and they're like, I always know when you guys fish because, you know, it looks this way. And I'm like, well, what about real ones? She's like, yeah, I, I never click on anything. Well, like, well, what do you do with it once you've, you've figured that out? Well, I just delete it. And I'm like, well, you're not helping the rest of the, the company. There's other people in the organization that may not be as, you know, awesome at, you know, figuring out if a fish is real or not, or if this is, you know, a, a real document or this is a real email, that's stuff that you should be sharing back and making sure the incident response team has time to pull that out of everyone's inbox, block the indicators, that sort of thing. So um, I put some links down here if, you know, if you're not very familiar with some of the stuff, but um, you can, you know, look at different uh, simulations like Red Canary has one. Uh, the MITRE ATT&CK framework is a good start to look at techniques that you can try in, so inside your corporation just to start doing something. You might not be ready for a, a pen test, you know, you might not be ready for a, a red team. Um, but the biggest thing that I totally love is purple teaming. Uh, when you take the, the defense side and you take um, you know, offense, and you go and get like an AD administrator, and you show them how you would pop the AD infrastructure, and you crack all the hashes, like like seventy five percent of the hashes crack with a you know the top one hundred passwords. 
I love it when I see the, the domain admins are like, what just happened? And they're like, we need to move to 2016. We need to put on a banned password. We need to make complex passwords. You know, I love it when other teams outside of security, if it's not even on the blue side, when it's the organization, when they're championing the stuff that they, they get it, when they're excited about it, they're like, we need to stop this. That's what I love. I love it when like three different teams come together, the defense and the offense, and then the third party, where if it was the firewall team, if it's the exchange team or the AD team, that, that's the stuff that's really exciting to me because they get it. And then they come back to you all the time and they're like, hey, I saw this new article about, you know, being able to compromise the domain about this. What, what should we you know, like? Should we use multi-factor to log into the computer? Should we have a separate, you know, jump bot? Like, I love it. Like they get into it and they're excited and I'm excited for them. Those are the things that, you know, that practice makes perfect working together. Um, Dave's talk earlier, he's excited about purple teaming. Purple teaming is awesome because when you come together and the red team's like, hey, did you see that? And they're like, nope. And the blue team's like, how did, what, ha how did that happen? And they're like, well, this is the technique I use. And they go, and maybe they use some of the EDR system or they use some, you know, like the Windows event logs. And they figure out like, hey, when you tried that, this bit count over here, it went up. I've never seen that before. This should be our own custom signature to detect that. Great. That is something that's not going to be, you know, protect, you know, that's not, you're not going to see that in your AV or your EDR system because you're learning those techniques and how it affects the system. So those are those niche things where you deploy this and maybe you catch a red team or maybe you catch a third party uh, red team that comes in that's not your own corporation's red team. So those, those are great wins when it comes to, you know, having a purple team to tear down the, the ins and outs of when an attack occurs and what it looks like. All right, so you've seen this. I mean, uh, uh, there are, you know, CDs like make your own hands. I would never thought in a million years I'd ever see like, Hey, I'm gonna go pick up some Everclear and make some hand sanitizer, or you know, make shirts, you know, take shirts and make masks, and you know, make your own bleach at home. They have all these great personal, you know, stuff that you have at home that you could be doing is awesome. I mean, this stuff is great. Like, every all the in the engineers are coming out. You know, rebuilding. I think I saw that the guy who originally made the N95 mask, he's coming out of retirement because he wants to make something better or what, whatever the case may be. That's awesome. I love that. Same thing can happen inside your, your company as well. You know, um, looking at your antivirus, have, maybe you have AV on your exchange system. Have you ever taken a look to see when that updates? Because maybe that updates every 24 hours. Well, that's not going to help you. Everyone knows that, you know, AV changes on the daily. Like, it just changed. It just changed right now. You know, like, as we're sitting here, there's new AV viruses, things coming out right now. Same thing with Yara rules. Um, Dave gave a talk a long time ago um, about taking the stuff that you already have and making sure it's configured right to catch maybe not everything, but majority of it, you know, building stuff like Yara rules, go check out the current tools you have. Maybe you have an EDR that accepts Yara signature, or maybe you have something in your email path that accepts Yara signatures. Um, look at where, you know, your traffic's coming from. The geolocation. Is there a reason why you need to have that country allowed? Do you allow Tor to come into your network? Is there a reason that you need to have that? Do people commonly pay their bills when they come to your website on Tor? No, shut it off. Um, understand the blocks as well, because if you're just sitting there and you know you're excited, you're like, yep, I'm good. My AV and my mail filters, they're all working, they're blocking. I don't have any problems. 
Well, you should understand what that is blocking, and that's the intelligence that you need to be sharing back to other corporations. I gave this uh, a very similar talk to this, um, to, we'll just we'll call them the five eyes. Uh, and I said to the, a lot of the ISPs were, hey, you know, we should be sharing this information because nine times out of 10, there might be a friend, a loved one, or whatever the case may be on my network that I am protecting. And if you didn't share that threat intelligence with me, they might get compromised or they might lose their business because of X, Y, and Z, you know, ransomware. So, you know, understanding the blocks and sharing that back. Don't just let the tools do their thing and not understand what's happening. You should look at that data. It, even if it's, you know, you do it once a month, so what? You did it once. That was a small enough thing, like I said earlier. Just do something small. Um, you know, looking at your, your password policies that, that you have deployed, are they strong enough? You know, are they outside of eight characters? Because, you know, you can go buy a, a, a graphics card and smash right through. And, you know, if you're able to, you know, crack all the passwords just because your policy is like, you know, oh, it's five characters, you know, and th those video cards now are, you know, that's, you know, a good three minutes or something like that. Um, and removing admin rights. Uh, does accounting need to have admin rights? Does you know the janitor need to have admin rights? Look at the cloud exposure. Understand what you're putting up there. Is there a reason maybe you don't need other organizations to be able to access your cloud infrastructure? Uh, is it two-factor? Do you allow it outside of the company IP space? You know, is there a reason, does, do home users need to have access? Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. I gave some URLs at the bottom um, that you can go and you know look through your systems externally. You know these are things that you know you can do yourself at, on your own time. You know, look at your your corporation and you know find issues. Uh, so now let, let's talk about the intelligence portion. So I'm sure everyone has seen these. Uh, we'll just call them. It's like a, a sim. You know, this is the cool thing where the pew pew map comes to life. You know, this is where the executives are like, look, we've got all these red dots which show that these are attacks that are going on. You know, this is stuff that we're, we're very familiar with and we always laugh when we see the pew pew map, but this is the thing that drives everything. The pew pew map, everyone loves the pew pew map. So if, if we look at the, how important it is to share threat intelligence, um, you know, doctors do this at a different scale. So if they have, you know, a wound on someone, they take a photo, they send it to another doctor and like, hey, what do you think of this? They're not really sharing like who the person is, but they're like, have you ever seen a cut like this? I, it's not healing or whatever. And, you know, they just go back and forth like, oh, have you tried, you know, putting shampoo into the wound? They're like, what? You know, it's that, that stuff, like sharing the threat intelligence um, back and forth where, you know, doctors are in a different space than us because a lot of times when we want to share threat intelligence, if you share something and like, oh, did you get breached? You know, like, whoa, you got hacked. You know, your stock's going to be, you know, it's going to suffer from that. But that's where having, you know, these trust groups and, you know, getting involved. I have some links and uh, I'll give you here shortly. But, you know, having those links and sharing with like corporations is is key you know building a relationship where maybe you're not a malware reverse engineer but somebody else in your sharing group they might be and they could take that information and you know pivot on it and say like hey you know what this is you know like this is a new type of rat we didn't, we've never seen this. this is you know command shell whatever php uh, C99 shell, they, they're able to break all this stuff down and, and share that back with you. And that, that it's very key to, um, you know, building that threat, uh, threat intelligence. And there's a lot of groups that are doing it. Uh, one thing I totally recommend is standing up MISP. Um, don't 
buy some threat intelligence product where, because a lot of times what happens is uh, you get sold, um, you know, a device that you store all this information in. I don't, a lot of companies aren't ready for that. They're not ready to aggregate, but at least with MISP, you can play around with it. Um, you can take threat intelligence from other groups. You know, you can connect, um, you can communicate with other teams through MISP, saying, you know, like, hey, we're seeing this, and you can have a discussion. And, you know, eventually you'll get to a point where you're needing to take a feed out of MISP, and maybe you want that feed to be a text file that your firewall consumes, that you're going to just block. Not blindly block, but things that you trust. Um, and, you know, looking at the ISAL, for example, they've got like a huge list of sharing groups, and I highly recommend finding your industry, joining one of those groups, and learning from people that are probably way smarter than me when it comes to, um, you know, protecting or, you know, even looking like at the FSI sectors um, circle. Go out there, look at the stuff. Um, this is actually missed put together their own version of COVID-19 tracking, which is really awesome because they're also sharing the indicators from, um, you know, phishing emails. So, you know, there, it, it was a really cool case where you saw, you know, the real world data and cyber data coming together and putting it in one place where uh, you can store all this and it's not in your inbox you know because a lot of times you get like a PDF I'm really a big advocate of MISP and you know having that data sit somewhere where you you can get to it and other people can use it as well and not just in your inbox and you know that's where it goes to die and that is my talk thank you guys Yeah, everybody give it up for Serbo. So, Serbo, do you have a, do you want to take any questions or do you got yeah, people totally. just come talk to you? Would you have them? No, they, talk we, to can, you? we can do, okay. if the questions okay. thing is working, let's. Yeah, let's, now we'll give it a shot here. Let's hang, hang with me. We'll uh, see if we can get everybody. Uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and raise your hand. We have a few minutes. We can uh, take a couple questions. Are you going to moderate that for me? Yeah, yeah. So, okay, cool. Jess Coburn, you're on air now. Do you have a question? Are we having that problem like we did earlier where the they're not able to come off mute? No, I, I put them on air, so just I give them okay. the prompt. Jess Co no, no question, and no hand raise. Okay. So, if anybody has a question, feel free to raise your hand. I will... Call on you. Jessica Burn. Oh, I guess we should say it's the button on the right, not on the the emoji. Yeah, so on the right hand side of your screen you'll see a you'll see a raised hand. Uh, just press it one time if you have a question. If you don't spam the button or anything like that, just one time should should allow you to uh, for me to see you. All right. Well, I'll just I'll just wait in case somebody has one. Well, well, maybe we could just open up the room and maybe people want to come up and ask questions personally or yeah, there's problems. Work. I'll turn the hand raises off and then uh, I'll unmute everybody here. It's for people that if you didn't like this talk, hit Alt F four on your computer and you'll be uh, rewarded. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs>